Vaughan Roberts, The Man Revealed. Vaughan Roberts is a high-profile evangelical Christian leader. He is rector of St. Ebb's Church in Oxford and director of the Proclamation Trust. He is a popular conference speaker and the author of many books, including Transgender and the Battles Christians Face. Vaughan Roberts has a special ministry among same-sex attracted men, encouraging them to share their struggles in church. His profile, which is published on the Living Out website, describes his own long-term struggles with same-sex attraction. My name is Vaughan Roberts. I work as a pastor in a church right in the centre of Oxford. I'm a Christian because I believe it to be true. I believe the claims of Jesus Christ to be real. So I really think he is God. I really think he, he loves me. I think language in this whole area is, is complex because different people mean different things by being gay. Some just simply mean they're same-sex attracted, and that is me. I don't choose to use the language of being gay because I think that, for many people, implies an identity. And I don't regard this as my identity. It's just part of my experience of life. But my fundamental identity is as a Christian. That's who I am, and that determines how I want to live my life. And so I just choose to say something like I experience same-sex attraction rather than saying I'm gay, which sounds as a bit like I'm embracing an identity, which I'm not. The term same-sex attraction is a euphemism to lessen the impact of the word homosexual. The purpose is to make same-sex attracted Christians appear to be more acceptable in church circles than homosexual Christians. But where has the term come from? To answer this question, we need to turn to the 2010 Third Lucerne Congress on World Evangelization in Cape Town, South Africa. As someone who has struggled with same-sex attraction, spent years struggling in silence in the church, it's such a great um, blessing, very exciting to see this many people in this room, to see this many people interested in this issue and realizing this issue is impacting the global evangelization. And, and want you to know and to hear this, that, that homosexuality is not an issue to be defeated or a people to be silenced. Four advanced papers to guide the Lucerne sessions on sexuality aim to help the church respond with compassion and grace by demystifying homosexuality. The term same-sex attracted was introduced as a viable Christian identity. The paper Homosexuality in the Church, which used the phrase same-sex attraction 15 times, commented, some of the souls who are impacted by same-sex attraction are Christians, and some are not. The advanced papers argued that a big problem in the church is that same-sex attracted people are being marginalized. Although Vaughan Roberts was a keynote speaker at the 2010 Congress, his same-sex attraction was not yet public knowledge. It was two years after the Congress in Cape Town that Roberts drew the attention of the evangelical world to his same-sex attraction in his book, The Battles Christians Face. In a revised edition of the book, published in 2012, Vaughan Roberts mentions his struggles with homosexuality. He writes, My motivation for writing the preface and answering the questions in the interview in Evangelicals Now is pastoral. I believe there is value in a greater openness to talk about these issues in evangelical churches. Undoubtedly, the coming out of Roberts was carefully orchestrated by evangelical Anglicans and the Proclamation Trust. Many evangelical Anglicans were quick to comment on what they referred to as his heroic stance in supporting marginalized same-sex Christians. The Good Book Company, for example, lauded Robert's actions as brave 
and courageous. An interview with Evangelicals Now provided a sympathetic platform for Roberts to explain his position to the evangelical world. The interview focused on Vaughan Roberts' long-term struggles with same-sex attraction, which he views as a temptation and therefore not sinful. Now, there are some of us whose sexual desires are predominantly or entirely towards the same sex. That's not sinful in and of itself. We're called to resist temptation. Roberts offers an example to show how same-sex desires can even lead to marriage. He explains how one of his same-sex attracted friends, having studied the Bible, discovered his fundamental identity as a Christian man. He still didn't want to get married to a woman. He wasn't attracted to women. But he realised it was not impossible. And so he thought, well, at least in theory, I'm open to the possibility. And then to his great surprise, he developed a very strong friendship and he found the friendship, sexual feelings grew in the friendship and he got married. He says, my sexuality hasn't changed at all. I love my wife. I lust after men. But very happily married. Yeah, we note the inconsistency of Robert's teaching. While he says same-sex attraction is a temptation, he tells us of his happily married same-sex attracted friend who lusts after men. And for a same-sex attracted married man to lust after men is sinful. This is the central point of Robert's same-sex ministry. He claims that his same-sex desire for sex with a man is not sinful. Yet his same-sex friend, in a moment of honesty, confessed that he lusts after men. So how does Roberts distinguish between same-sex desire and same-sex lust? Later in this video, he tells us of his unfulfilled longings for an exclusive sexual relationship with someone of the same sex. All our sexual desires are broken in some way. There's not a single person who doesn't desire sex outside of that context. Roberts is creating the myth that all believers, just like everybody else, are sexual sinners. But sexual purity is at the heart of the Christian faith. It is God's will that his people should be holy and abstain from sexual immorality and not in the passion of lust, like unbelievers. Christians are to flee sexual immorality. It should not even once be named among believers. Roberts writes, Although God loves those who are attracted to the same sex, he does not approve of homosexual practice. We are not to feel guilty or condemned because of our temptations whether homosexual or heterosexual, but nor should we express them sexually except in heterosexual marriage. Roberts is separating homosexual desire, which he refers to as a temptation, from homosexual practice. But the Bible makes no such distinction. Believers are to put to death evil desire. Roberts says, in countering the simplistic binary model of the world that people are either born gay or straight, or occasionally bi. We are prone to make overly dogmatic comments ourselves about causation and cure. These can be heard to imply that homosexual attraction is just a matter of personal choice. I have become convinced, therefore, that we need not only a greater openness in discussing issues of sexuality, but also a more positive vision and presentation of the nature of faithful discipleship for those who struggle in this area. Roberts is implying that homosexual attraction is not a personal choice. The inference is that some people are born with a homosexual orientation, and so it is natural for them to have homosexual desires. The claim that some people are born with a homosexual orientation 
is a psychological construct which is contrary to biblical truth. In response to the question, is change possible? Roberts says, The development of sexuality is complex and is, I think, best understood as being on a spectrum, along which individuals can move, especially in the years soon after puberty, but also later. A small proportion of people, including Christians, find that they remain exclusively attracted to the same sex as they grow into mature adulthood. God has the power to change their orientation, but he hasn't promised to, and that has not been my experience. Research suggests that complete change from exclusively homosexual desires to exclusively heterosexual ones is very rare. While supporting the right of anyone to seek help to change if they wish, our emphasis needs to be on encouragement to be godly and content in current circumstances. According to Roberts, Christians with a homosexual orientation should be encouraged to be content with their circumstances, accept their homosexual desires and strive to be godly homosexuals. Such a concept is anathema to the Christian faith. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? Robert says, The Bible is very clear that God loves everyone and welcomes all into his family, the church, through faith in Christ, whatever our gender, class or race and, we might add, sexuality. We do need to keep stressing that. Robert says that the God of love welcomes all into his family, whatever their sexuality. However, Scripture warns that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God and mentions adulterers, homosexuals and sodomites, among others. In a word of encouragement, the Apostle Paul refers to those who have repented of their sin and have been washed by the blood of Christ and sanctified by the Spirit of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So it is the repentant sinner, the one who has turned from the sin of homosexuality, who is welcomed by God into his family. Following on from Vaughan Roberts' groundbreaking statement in 2012, a year later, another evangelical, Sam Albury, who worked with Vaughan Roberts as a student pastor for three years, made a similar announcement. Roberts' thinking undoubtedly influenced Albury's book, Is God Anti-Gay?, published in 2013, and the founding of the Living Out website. Both these initiatives reflect the pro-gay sentiments of Roberts. In 2017, Sam Albury addressed the General Synod of the Church of England, openly declaring his same-sex attraction. I am same-sex attracted and have been my entire life. Uh, by that I mean that I have sexual, romantic and deep emotional attractions to people of the same sex. Aubrey has done much to popularise the term same-sex attraction in the church. He writes, I prefer to talk in terms of someone who experiences homosexual feelings or same-sex attractions. Over the last decade, Aubrey has become an important spokesman for the same-sex Christian lobby. He is a speaker and apologist for Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, he is also an editor of the Gospel Coalition. As a clean-cut, respectable, same-sex attracted Christian, he has the ideal profile to lead a pro-gay propaganda campaign. At the centre of Albury's argument is the assertion that same-sex attraction is a temptation and therefore not sinful. In his book, the Hedonism and Homosexuality of John Piper and Sam Albury, Enoch Burke comments on Albury's interpretation of Romans 1. 
Aubrey here attempts to make Romans 1 refer to same-sex desire, rather than the lust or sinful acts of homosexuality. Aubrey regularly refers to same-sex desire as merely a temptation, describing it as homosexual feelings, or simply same-sex attraction. However, Paul does not mention temptation at all in this passage. Rather, he speaks of the lusts and acts of homosexuality. This is clearly communicated by the specific words Paul uses in verse 26, atemias pathe, meaning vile or shameful passions, and verse 27, ashemosune, meaning shamefulness or shameful acts. Paul here portrays the involvement of men and women in homosexuality as a purposeful course of action for which they are responsible. The purpose of the same-sex campaign of Vaughan Roberts and Sam Albury is to normalise homosexuality in the church. They want Christians to believe that same-sex attraction is a temptation and therefore not sinful. They want Christians to feel free to talk openly about their same-sex attractions in church. In August 2016, at the third Lusanne Younger Leaders Gathering held in Jakarta, Indonesia, Vaughan Roberts mentioned four invaluable lessons he had learned from 25 years of ministry, including his own struggle against same-sex attraction. But um, Vaughan, why did you decide to become open about same-sex attraction? I often ask myself the same question, Grace. <laughs> Um, it's a strange thing for me because in my teenage years I was conscious of same-sex attraction. I just assumed it would go away and it never did. This is a strange response coming from an experienced Christian leader. For God's word never tells a believer to assume that evil desire will just go away. Scripture instructs the believer to put to death uncleanness passion, evil desire. I've never defined myself in this way. I've never called myself gay. This is not the definition of who I am. But when um, in England the government started moving towards same-sex marriage, I knew that we'd, we'd need to say we didn't agree with this as Christians. And I was very worried for uh, the many Christians who experience same-sex attraction. And I was meeting more and more people who sadly had this experience and, and struggle, but felt they couldn't share it in church. I thought that would happen even more. This is one of the main obstacles in evangelism. And those who, as I very firmly do, take the view that the Bible clearly says that sex is for the marriage of man, one man and one woman for life and no, no other context, that they dismiss us as homophobic. And that is an evangelistic barrier. So what has helped you personally in this area? What's helped me personally in this area is, is what I've just been talking about. We're all um, in a broken world. We're all, we're all sinners in a broken world. We're all sexual sinners as well as sinners in every area. And we all need the same kind of help. And, and, and he doesn't always promise to take away our struggles or particular temptations. He may do, but that's not the promise of the Bible. But he does promise to transform us. And often it's in ongoing brokenness and weakness, but the power of uh, the Spirit is seen as we persevere. Vaughan carries such a unique authority in this subject that a lot of us don't know what to do with in the area of struggles as Christian leaders. Vaughan Roberts seeks to counter the simplistic binary model of the world that people are either born gay or straight. He argues that the development of sexuality is complex and best understood as being on a spectrum which opens the way for a range of human sexualities on the continuum between heterosexuality and homosexuality. Yeah, it is important to understand that the concept of a sexual spectrum comes from the philosophy of Alfred Kinsey, known as the father of the sexual revolution. Kinsey was vehemently opposed to the Christian faith and spent his life 
researching human sexual behavior in order to promote his licentious, amoral sexual agenda. He vigorously promoted a hedonistic approach to sexual behavior, while at the same time denouncing the biblical view of sexual conduct as repressive. Indeed, Kinsey's research has been described by Judith Reisman, author of Kinsey, Sex and Fraud, as fraudulent. She has shown that Kinsey's so-called research has had a massive detrimental impact on public morality. Uh, we were, up to the end of the Second World War, a conservative Judeo-Christian nation. The turning point for all that was Dr. Alfred Kinsey, his book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, 1948. He was the father of the sexual revolution and therefore the father of everything that has come from that. And certainly one of the key things was pornography. Dr. Alfred Kinsey ushered the destruction of our nation's moral code with his books, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male and Sexual Behavior in the Human Female, known as the Kinsey Reports. The world recognized him as the leading scientific expert on human sexuality. The reports claim that humans were sexual from birth and that what we deemed as immoral sexual behavior was actually normal, thus making it moral. What people to this day are not aware of were the methods he used to collect his data. That's an around the clock experiment. Wow, that's torture. That's torture, you bet. He also actually employed bona fide pedophiles to, uh, to do what they did to children for his so-called data. Kinsey wanted to prove that we are sexual from birth, so it wasn't surprising that he drew his data from pedophiles, rapists, and murderers, convincing himself that his victim finds pleasure in the act of being raped. Using a stopwatch and a ledger, they recorded their sexual experiments, systematically molesting thousands of young children under the guise of science. This research was compiled in his books, Sexual Behavior of the Human Male and Sexual Behavior in the Human Female. Throughout his writings, Kinsey revealed a deep dislike of Christian morality, which he saw as the chief cause of sexual repression in Western society. On the basis of his research findings, Kinsey developed the heterosexual homosexual rating scale to describe a person's sexual orientation. The Kinsey scale presents human sexuality as a continuum between heterosexuality and homosexuality. Vaughan Roberts is completely given over to Kinsey's unbiblical concept of a sexual spectrum. He writes, We cannot be sure how many people feel same-sex attraction. The Kinsey Report of 1948 concluded that 4% of white American men are exclusively homosexual throughout their lives. Human sexuality is more complicated than is commonly imagined and is perhaps best seen as making up a complex spectrum. In an address to the Symposium on Human Sexuality and Biblical Interpretation, organized by the Methodist Church in Ireland, Roberts explained, For the first time in Britain last year, amongst young adults, the majority placed themselves not at, as it were, zero to ten on the sexuality scale, but the majority said they were somewhere along the spectrum of recognizing within themselves some degree of both opposite and same-sex attraction. So this binary view is not the case. Incredible. Roberts has accepted the findings of a sociological survey and the fraudulent research of Alfred Kinsey to support his notion of a sexual spectrum. Sexual orientation is a psychological construct unknown to scripture. According to psychology today, sexual orientation describes patterns of sexual, romantic and emotional attraction. Many in the homosexual world claim that they are born with a homosexual orientation. 
Those with sexual desires for both men and women are classified as bisexuals. Most medical experts, including the American Psychological Association, surmise that sexual orientation involves a complex mix of biology, psychology and environmental factors. Some believe a person's genes and hormones play an important role. The psychological view is that sexual orientation is not something that a person voluntarily chooses. The concept of sexual orientation is a powerful weapon in the hands of those who seek to normalize homosexuality in the church. It opens the way for the claim that some people are born with a homosexual orientation and therefore unable to change. Hence the vehement opposition of the homosexual movement to any attempt to change a person's sexual orientation. God has the power to change our sexual orientation, but he may not do so. And yet, even if he does not, we can be sure that if we look to him, his spirit will give us the strength to resist temptation and grow in godliness. Robert's teaching that God helps people with a homosexual orientation to grow in godliness is a serious error. Roberts refers to sociological research to support his assertion that changes in sexual desire are rare. Yet scripture teaches that the gospel of Christ has the power to change lives. Born-again believers are new creations in Christ and no longer slaves to sin. We hear Robert's preaching at the Keswick Convention from Romans chapter 1. It's worth stressing, because this is a, obviously uh, a very important subject in our context, that Paul is speaking about homosexual practice, not about homosexual feelings. He's not saying that those who experience such attractions are especially wicked. We all face different temptations. I've been open myself about my own experience of same-sex attraction. And if this is a particular issue for you, can I say, do not let it be a lonely battle. I hope you'll feel able to talk about it openly with at least a trusted person in church. And you might find the websites that I've jotted down on your outlines helpful. True Freedom Trust and Living Out. Roberts is blatantly using the Keswick Convention to encourage same-sex attracted people to talk about their sexual struggles in church. Roberts divides homosexuality into those with homosexual feelings of which God approves and those who practice homosexuality of which God does not approve. Yet the concept of homosexual feelings, distinct from homosexual practice, is unknown to the Bible. Roberts is concerned that some churches do not make same-sex attracted Christians feel welcome. He writes, Those who experience same-sex attraction can be especially sensitive because of the frequent condemnation of homosexuality in some churches. Many begin to sense that they would not only be shunned by their fellow believers if their homosexual feelings became known, but that God also disapproves of them simply because of their desires. But that is certainly not true. Roberts is trying to convince his readers that although God disapproves of homosexual practice, he does not disapprove of homosexual desires. He writes, although God loves those who are attracted to the same sex, he does not approve of homosexual practice. He says that many who believe the Bible are warmly supportive and affirming of those who have homosexual feelings. Nonetheless, we should recognize that sinful homophobic attitudes do exist in our churches. And again, the clear teaching of Scripture as understood by Christians for 2,000 years, forbids homosexual practice. But we should not forget there are many believers largely hidden 
who also have homosexual feelings. But in obedience to Christ and his word, do not believe it is right for them to engage in homosexual activity. Robert sums up his advice. We are right to affirm the Bible's prohibition of homosexual sex, but we dare not do so without ensuring that we also make every effort to provide the necessary support to enable those with homosexual feelings to live godly lives. In his testimony, published on the Living Out website, Robert speaks of his longing for an exclusive sexual relationship. He says this is a challenge for him because his desire is for it to be with someone of the same sex, that is, a man. So, well, to realise that my longing, which I think is shared by pretty much everyone, for an exclusive relationship, sexual relationship, um, that's going to be a challenge for me because the desire is for that to be with someone of the same sex. And that's, that's not going to be realised. I don't think that would be right to be realised. That's a challenge. It, there's a pain in that. Roberts has publicly expressed his homosexual feelings for an exclusive sexual relationship with a man. He feels that his desire for a same-sex relationship is simply a temptation. But to put his same-sex desire into practice is to engage in homosexual activity, and that is not right. According to the Bible, homosexual desire is a vile affection. The thought of two men having sex is shameful. The message of Colossians is straightforward. Evil desire is to be put to death. Our Lord said, Whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Likewise, any man who desires an exclusive sexual relationship with another man, has already committed the sin of homosexuality in his heart. In his address to the Symposium on Human Sexuality, Roberts comments on the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I think you'd be foolish to base any condemnation of any same-sex activity or relationship on Genesis 19. I think some of the shock behind it is flowing from the assumption that homosexual behavior is wrong. But in and of itself, clearly homosexual rape is not acquainted with a loving same-sex relationship. I would warn people against basing anything simply on that text alone and the equivalent text in Judges 19. The instances of um, in Genesis 19 and, and Judges of what it counts of effectively homosexual rape and a massive breach of hospitality, I think, can't be simply used as a ge generic statement against homosexual sex. In his book, The Battles Christians Face, Roberts writes, The traditional interpretation reflected in the word sodomy is that homosexuality is the sin which prompted God to destroy Sodom. But this is reading too much into the passage and into an account of a similar incident in Judges 19. The sin the rabble threatens is gang rape, which is obviously unacceptable, whether it is heterosexual or homosexual. These passages should not be used to argue against homosexual sex in general. Viewing scripture through the lens of his homosexual feelings, Robert says Genesis 19 only condemns homosexual rape and not loving same-sex relationships. Therefore, it is foolish to believe that Genesis 19 teaches that homosexuality is wrong. His reference to loving same-sex relationships is a desperate attempt to justify homosexual relationships. The Bible refers to such relationships founded on lust as an abomination. The arrogance of Roberts is staggering. He is engaging in hermeneutical gymnastics that are completely alien 
to the original meaning of the text. He wants us to believe that the Christian church has been wrong for 2,000 years in believing that Sodom and Gomorrah teach that homosexuality is a heinous sin against nature. Even before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Yet Lot chose to dwell in the cities of the plain of Jordan and pitched his tent close to Sodom. God's promise to Abraham was that he would become a great and mighty nation and that all the nations of the earth would be blessed in him. The Lord did not hide from Abraham that he planned to destroy Sodom because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grave. Abraham interceded with God, the judge of all the earth, that he would spare Sodom if ten righteous people could be found. When the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Lot invited the two men to spend the night in his house. Before they lay down for the night, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, surrounded the house and called to Lot, Where are the men who came in to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Matthew Henry comments, It was the most unnatural and abominable wickedness that they were now set upon, a sin that still bears their name, and it is called sodomy. These headstrong sinners were governed only by lust and passion. Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. The two angels, having rescued Lot from the men of the city, said, We will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. In 2 Peter chapter 2, we learn that God condemned and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, making them an example to those who would live ungodly. The Apostle Peter says, that righteous Lot was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Dwelling among the men of Sodom, Lot's righteous soul was tormented from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. The men of Sodom walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. The book of Jude describes the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah as having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Scripture is clear. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was grave, lawless, sensuous sexual immorality that tormented the soul of Lot. In short, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was the abomination of homosexuality. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of the heinous sin described in Romans as vile affections that are against nature. Unrepentant homosexuals are among those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Reverend Ken Patterson, in an address to the Presbyterian General Assembly in Belfast, described homosexuality as a sin of the most heinous kind, which calls down the judgment of God upon the sinner, or a society or church, which tolerates or promotes or practices it. He continued, I know of no other sin which caused God to destroy whole cities in ancient times, but that is what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. The sin of homosexuality is the ultimate rebellion against the God who created man in his own image, male and female, and a willful rejection of God's command to be fruitful and multiply. For homosexual relations are sterile. The shame of homosexuality is that it celebrates its own depravity 
and approves of the depravity of others. It gathers as a community to promote its cause, fights for its rights, and demands that society and the church affirm its conduct. Opposition to the homosexual agenda is condemned by the word homophobia. In his interview with Evangelicals Now, Roberts says, I believe there is value in a greater openness to talk about these issues in evangelical churches. Here we should note that a key aim of the homosexual agenda is to normalize homosexuality in the church. Encouraging church members to talk openly about their homosexual feelings in church is a key step in the normalization process. Homosexuality is no longer regarded as a vile affection that is against nature, but just as another sin, like gossiping. Robert's assertion that it is foolish to use Genesis 19 to condemn homosexuality indicates how far he is prepared to go in order to downplay the wickedness of homosexuality. In his interpretation of Romans 1, he asks the question, Why does Paul mention homosexual practice first? Are we really to believe that he thinks this is the worst sin, even worse than murder, which comes in a list later from verse uh, 29 onwards? But he cannot be thinking that homosexual sin is somehow worse than anything else. Um, If he does think that, it's strange that he only mentions it on two other occasions in the New Testament. Vaughan Roberts is the intellectual powerhouse of the same-sex movement that is seeking to normalize homosexuality in the church. He has the remarkable ability to mix truth and error without the slightest hesitation. He promotes the biblical view of marriage while teaching a false interpretation of Romans 1. He teaches that a man is born again by accepting Christ as Saviour, yet he denies that Genesis 19 has any relevance to the Christian position on homosexuality. He promotes the Living Out website despite its unbiblical teaching on sexual orientation. The warning of Scripture is clear. In the last days, there will be men who set themselves up as servants of righteousness to deceive the people of God. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. It is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Vaughan Roberts has disguised himself as a servant of righteousness, promoting the term same-sex attraction as a euphemism for the sin of homosexuality. A central objective of his vast ministry is to downplay the wickedness of homosexuality. He denies that the biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah is about homosexual sex. He says, therefore, that it is foolishness to base any condemnation of homosexual sex on Genesis 19. He reinterprets Romans chapter 1, denying that it teaches that homosexuality is a heinous sin against the Creator. He promotes the notion of a sexual spectrum, which comes from the wicked philosophy of Alfred Kinsey, father of the sexual revolution. He refers to a homosexual relationship as a loving same-sex relationship. We must conclude that Vaughan Roberts, despite his popularity among evangelicals of the Proclamation Trust, is no friend of the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Roberts has crept into a position of authority in the church and is turning the grace of God into lewdness. His message of same-sex attraction is unknown in God's word and must be firmly rejected.